There are two sides to the legacy of Pete Maravich. There is a side that was openly available to the public. If you want to research about him, you'll find countless highlights of some of the most jaw-dropping plays. If you were to Google search this player, you'd see multiple references of ex-players who sang his praises about the amazing talent he was. But there is a whole other side to this player. There were ex-teammates who questioned his motives and journalists who accused him of being a gunner and a loser. Let's travel back to the 70s and find out what the real feeling about this player was. We start from the beginning. Before he played his first NBA game, he was considered the most electrifying and prolific shooter in college basketball history. He averaged over 44 points per game for his college career while making shots the world had never seen before. The expectations and hype for him were extremely high. So much so that the Atlanta Hawks signed him to a five-year contract worth $1.6 million. Giving this kind of money to a rookie in the 70s was unheard of. He needed to show that he was worthy of all the hype and money quickly. It didn't help matters that some of his teammates were unhappy with the contract he signed. Most notably was Joe Caldwell. He went straight to the ABA because of his frustrations with the contract given to the unproven rookie. Those types of expectations and negative publicity haunted Pete for the rest of his career. The NBA fans and media don't respond very well when an overhyped prospect doesn't meet our lofty expectations. For Pete Maravich, it took him a couple of years to adjust to the NBA. By his third season, he started to play at a high level. In 1973, he finished 5th in points per game and 6th in assists per game. In 1974, he was 2nd in points per game. He was striving individually, but the team lost much more than they won. In his 4 years with the Atlanta Hawks, they had one winning season. They reached the playoffs 3 times and never won a series. This was confounding. To NBA fans as Atlanta Hawks seemed to have enough talent on paper to strive. This team had its version of a big three. They had six-time All-Star and Hall of Famer Lou Hudson. They played very well together. In fact, they were the top scoring duo in 1971, 1973, and 1974. They also had Hall of Famer Walt Bellamy. He was in the tail end of his prime but was still a double-double machine. Despite the talent, the Hawks were mostly just an average team. Who was blamed for their struggles? It was Pete Maravich. According to the Fort Myers News Press, the writer wrote, he has been charged time and time again of being the infection that has made the Atlanta Hawks a sick basketball franchise. He has been called selfish, a player who fails to conform for the good of the team. This type of sentiment affected the way his contemporaries viewed him. During this time, it was the players that voted for the league's most valuable player award. In 1973, when he finished 5th in points, 6th in assists, and the Hawks had the 4th best record in the Eastern Conference, he finished 19th in MVP voting. In the following year, when he was 2nd in points, he finished 17th in MVP voting. It is hard to explain why the players thought so little of him. The numbers say that he was at the very least a top 10 player, but that's not how he was viewed. It's clear that this wasn't just the media creating the narrative that he was a selfish player who didn't contribute to winning. The players must have felt the same way, but they weren't the only ones. Team owners and coaches did not view him positively. We know this by what happened in the 1974 offseason. The Hawks were looking to cut ties with him and they were shopping him around to anybody that was interested. According to the magazine Pro Basketball Sports Stars of 1975, Atlanta's GM Pat Williams said that they tried everyone, but there were no takers. Nobody wanted him. Why did nobody want this once in a generation talent? There are a few reasons. There was an off-court reputation that he had. According to the autobiography of the former player and jazz announcer Hot Rod Hundley, he came over from Atlanta 
and had all the money and partied too much. Apparently, that was a big reason why he was suspended by head coach Con Fitzsimmons during the 1974 season. The teams of the league thought he was more trouble than he was worth. However, there was one team that was ready to give up everything for Pistol Pete. And I mean that in the most literal sense. It was a newly formed team, New Orleans Jazz. Keep in mind that the Hawks did not allow Pete to be acquired in the 1974 expansion draft. He was traded to a team that had very little resources to acquire such a player. This was the deal that they agreed to. They sent the first guard and four chosen in the expansion draft in a total of five future draft picks. This was considered a foolish deal. Every expansion team needs to hold on to the draft picks in order to build a strong team in the future. They let them all go away for one player. To add insult to injury, two of those picks will end up being Hall of Fame players. That's David Thompson and Alex English. Pete Maravich and the New Orleans Jazz were set up to fail right from the beginning. There was no way that he could prove to his doubters that he could help a team win. The unfortunate thing was that he was reaching the peak of his career. All he could do was put on a show. Whether you loved him or hated him, you couldn't help but marvel at the things he was doing. That was especially the case in the 1976-77 season. He averaged 31.1 points, 5.4 assists, and 5.1 rebounds per game. He won the scoring title and finished third in MVP voting. This was also the sixth highest scoring average during the 70s. As far as his most notable performances, there were four games where he scored over 50 points. That includes the iconic performance against the New York Knicks. He scored 68 points on 61% shooting. Many of the shots that he was taking were from three-point range. If the three-point line existed, it is very possible that he could have scored closer to 80 points. That is a perfect example of what makes his basketball career so unique. He was an innovator. He was constantly looking to revolutionize and expand the game to new heights. He saw where the game was headed and he was ready to adjust accordingly. The problem is that the league was much slower in accepting that style of play. They were even less inclined to accept it from him. Here's the sad reality of the situation. When you're displaying that kind of creativity and that childlike imagination to the game while you're winning, they call it passion. When you're doing all that while you're losing, they call you an egocentric loser that lacks maturity. That's the cold business of the game. As great as his numbers were, there were many people who didn't like the way he carried himself. He gave the impression that he was bigger than the team. For example, an anonymous league executive told the Washington Post in 1977 that Pete Maravich knows he's bigger than the Jazz. Pete thinks he's Smokey Robinson and the rest of the Jazz are the miracles. The problem is that he's right. For all the Gen Zers out there, that's like saying Pete Maravich thinks he's Adam Levine and the rest of the Jazz are the Maroon 5. I mean, what happened to all the great rock bands? But can you blame Pete for thinking that way? The Jazz were simply not good enough to be a playoff contending team. Although he was the only player that season to average over 27 points per game, the Jazz had the sixth lowest scoring average in the league. The Jazz had no other starting player who averaged more than 13 points and shot better than 50% from the field. This was a one-man show and their only hope to win games was for Pistol Pete to carry this team on his back. For a player that has to battle through injuries, that is never something that you want. Unfortunately for basketball fans, this was the last time that we got to see a full season from him. Knee injuries derailed his career until he decided to call it quits in 1980. In his final season, he was finally able to play for a winning team. Although it was only for 26 games, he experienced a 61-win season with the Boston Celtics and won a playoff series for the first time in his career. 
It would have been interesting to see how he would have adjusted his game to Larry Bird, but we never got to see that. So this is the conundrum that we're faced with when evaluating his career. He was a one-of-a-kind talent, but only contributed to two winning seasons. He was great individually, but only won one playoff series. It's interesting that according to the Fort Myers News Press, he said this before playing with the New Orleans Jazz. I don't think I'll ever be with the winning basketball team, and I will always be blamed for not being one. The question is, does he deserve the blame? What do you all think? Was he not a winning player, or was he just a victim of circumstance? What do you remember the most from Pete Maravich during his playing career? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.